The program is Outside the Book, coming to you from the Carol Nicely Center in Bowling Green. It's our annual installment from the Southern Kentucky Festival of Books. I'm Barbara Deeb, your host, and for the next half hour, we'll be bringing you the author's outside the book. We start with Jim Madison, who's uh, by nature a graphic artist, but uh, he's just composed a book or written a book along with, uh, I want to get her name right, Melissa Duke Mooney, who's no longer with us. She is no longer with she us. She passed away, but in, in the middle of the book. Yeah, yes, in the middle, in the middle of, the book. of the book. And there's also, um, I have a, a partner too, uh, Connie Collinsworth. We worked on the book together. We are a print mafia. The, you are the print mafia. Yes, That's right. We got mafia. the print mafia here. Jim, thanks for joining us. You're a Bowling Green native. And as I mentioned, you are a graphic artist by, by nature. But you decided to contribute to this book, The ABCs of Rock. Let's talk a little bit about print mafia, first of all. Okay. What is that? It is, we are a design firm. We print what we design. Okay. And that's, we don't do anybody else's artwork. We just do and print our own stuff. Okay, so in, in this crazy world and with so many options out there, you've kind of carved a niche for yes. yourself because yeah. it's your original stuff that you do. Yes, it's, we're real lo-fi. We're, 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 we are what you call cut and paste. So we manipulate images, you know, just... Exacto knives and copy machines. Well, if you look at this book, The ABCs of Rock, there's a lot of images that are manipulated. And, but there, there's the written word and then there's the visual word, if you will. So that presents a challenge in and of itself, doesn't it? Um, yes. Yes, it does. I, we try to, um, I don't know, say a thousand words with the with a image. Well, it's kind of like television, right? You know, you've got the visuals that often do the speaking for you. So you try to say a thousand words with one image. So that means that that image is extremely important. Yes. It yes. is. So it takes an editorial eye. How do you do that? Um, we just, well, I guess we just know what we're doing. Does that make sense? Like we listen to the music <laughs> yes. and we try to, um, you know, soak it in and then put our Put, our, put an image to it. Now, in the book, you've got the ABCs of rock, so you've got some of the some of the, the stars, if you will. I noticed uh, one of my faves is Elvis Costello. Yes. So um, how do you take somebody like an Elvis Costello or an REM and make that image speak to what they are? Well, we try, We try. sometimes we break it down into songs. So like the REM is the, the man in the moon type, you know, but you mm -hmm. want to be... Um, you know, they have a huge career, a big REM fan. So um, it just, it's hard. It's, it's really hard to do that. And the bands you love the most are the hardest ones to make that come through. So did Why I is that? that because you, you're, you're afraid you're not going to pay them the right homage? Yes. yes. Yeah? Yeah. But now, do you have to be listening to their music when you're making that image? Um, it helps. It helps. We don't do it like all the time, mm -hmm. but you know it plays. It plays in our head the whole, the whole so time. So it certainly does inspire. Yes. It certainly does inspire. Yes. Talk to me about graphic images these days, because we've got a generation, and and I suspect the, the demographic for this would be that generation, whatever we want to call it. Um, where we're so inundated with images that it's almost difficult to decipher what we're seeing. So that speaks even more to the importance of what you're doing. Um, yes, I mean, there's, it's kind of a difference between like, you know, digital and like lo-fi. You know, we're more on the, the lo-fi um, back when, you know, before computers, um, you know, it's a lot easier to design now. And that's kind of what we go, what we go back to. And I think in that, our stuff stands out so any kind of distress any kind of pattern that we have in our in our artwork all the lines none of its digital so so you know ours is ours is real it's not baked in the computer now there are some amazing people doing stuff with computers mm -hmm. we just don't go that go that route do you think that at some point you will um no no. No. Okay. I mean, we, we, of course, we use the computer helps us get our artwork out there. So when we do like a poster and it's silk screen, you know, we scan and it, you know, then it turns into a computer image. But we right. don't like take images, manipulate them in the computer and then print them out on a printer. Mm -hmm. Ours are all hand silk screened and, and everything's just, you know, like cut, paste, you know. 
And in that sense, because it's original, your stuff, uh, from what I hear, stuff uh, done by Print Mafia, is becoming quite collectible. Well, we've been um, we've been doing posters and graphic design for 15 years mm -hmm. now. So we were on the ground level. On you know, did a lot of stuff for bands like. We did stuff for the White Stripes before they, you know, blew up right. and turned into what it is. So we are part of that, you know, part of that history, I guess. That's so, exciting. Yeah, so it is. So why decide to do a book, though? You know, you got the posters out there. Uh, did did the author come to you and say, "Help me do my images"? Um, yes, yes, she did. And we, and me, Melissa, and Connie, we just we just connected. So we, you know, grew up listening to the same stuff. So we, and, and we were all visual people. Mm -hmm. I remember um, like listening to the music was uh, like seeing those album covers. You know, I saw the album Jump. covers before I listened to the music. Mm -hmm. So I connected that. So that's what we were trying to do w with this book. And she wanted, she did, uh, Melissa came up with the idea with she wanted a ABC's book for her kids. And so there yes. you go, the yeah. ABC's yeah. of rock. She could not find this book. So we made that book. You know, one of the great illustra album illustrators recently died, uh, yes. the guy who yeah. did Led Zeppelin and yes. some of those. But those are iconic. Yes. Do you ever hope to get to that iconic status? I, I hope so, because I know, like, growing up, what it, what it, what it meant to me to see, um, you know, to see an album cover, to see, like, Eddie from Iron Maiden and what, it, like, how it affected me. So with this kids' book, some of these kids are seeing these images from these bands that we did, and that's hopefully when they get to be adults, but man, I had this book when I was a kid, because I do that all the time. Carrying we, on the yes. legacy. And when we do go to schools and sign books, whenever we open up to the KISS page, I mean, the kids scream. You know, some of them are scared to death, and some of them already know who it is, and you know, it creates that memory forever. Yes. Continued success to you. It's called the ABCs of Rock, the illustrator Jim Madison representing the print mafia. Thanks. Yes. Thank you. Outside the Book continues from the Carol Nicely Center as we bring you the authors outside the book. Dr. Bruce Kessler joins us. He represents Western Kentucky University as the head of the mathematics department, but he's also an author. Thanks for being here, Bruce. Glad to be here. Appreciate Glad it. Be. Now, math, of course, very important subject. Don't realize how much it applies to so many areas of life. And you knew this. You did a television program uh, about mathematics, and then you got to thinking, maybe there's a way that we can present it in a different way for kids. I, uh, I had seen an illustrator actually take minutes of a meeting and uh, I, the, the meeting itself was semi-interesting but watching the guy do the minutes and then even looking at them it, he, you know he was drawing the minutes not not writing them down he was drawing them and it was just fascinating to me and I thought you know that would be a great way to to kind of liven up things on paper that aren't necessarily that lively. The, the way we present math is not always in an interesting fashion, even in an applied fashion. It's more of an exercise sometimes, uh, uh, you know, something we do to make the teacher happy. And so I thought this is a great way to, to, to liven it up a bit, make it fun, and still get our point across, still get some, some content in there, and even in the process show them how it might actually be useful in the, in the world. Applied. You know, we just got done talking with a graphic artist from the Print yeah. Mafia, and he he was talking about the importance of the visual. Mm -hmm. You know, when you take something like mathematics and you've got numbers and, you know, people, but I get what you're saying here. So let, let's put it in a visual medium, but still have the same message. Right. So how do you go about doing that? Well, I think about the content that I want to put in the comic. And then I look for situations. The, the, the setup of the story is we have this very strong guy, but he's not, he's not the math guy. The two kids that he makes friends with are the, math, the, the mathematically talented people. And so I keep throwing him in situations where being super strong won't help. But being smart in mathematics will. And that's where the kids come in. So the kids are the real hero of every story. Uh, so, but that's the hard part, though, is finding a situation where being super strong really doesn't help. I didn't want it to be a contrived thing where it's like, well, yeah, but why don't you just pick up the pick up the car? I wanted it to be something where being strong really had no 
no, couldn't help at all. Right. And I didn't want the stories contrived, and I wanted the kids to be the heroes. So I've had pretty good luck. We've, we've written six episodes, six issues, and uh, I'm hoping to find the time to do some more. Would you eventually like to see this turned into some type of animation? It'd be cool. It'd be very neat. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that would be more eye-catchy. I, I know um, even students like to watch videos probably over reading. I thought that the comic thing might, um, I, comics aren't as popular as they used to be, but still, if you lay one down in front of a student, they will pick them up and start thumbing through them. So I thought that was a nice avenue to do that. It certainly lent itself to a superhero kind of format that I, that I had in mind. Well, do kids, you know, the, the STEM philosophy, okay, what we're pushing right now, right. science, technology, engineering and, math. engineering and math, so we're hoping that children are grasping that. You know, you've been doing this a little while. Are we changing the way in which we learn these subjects? We are. Um, in fact, the... You know, I'm, le I'm still learning myself how to teach things, and I'm learning from a lot of our SkyTeach people. Uh, SkyTeach is our teacher prep program, and you know the focus is, is moving away from me explaining it to you and you showing up at a particular time. It's moving to us saying, well, here's the situation. Now see if you can figure this out. And, and being nearby, and if they get stuck, giving them a little nudge. You know, Basically what we're trying to do now is teach them to think instead of, I have to cover this piece of content. And I, I believe that's more valuable because when you actually do leave school and you get yourself into a, a situation where you have to apply these things that we've taught you, it's not gonna match exactly what you've learned. You're gonna have to connect the dots. You're gonna have to figure it out for yourself. And so our focus is now moving to where we teach you to think for yourself, to figure it out for yourself and I'm just the expert, you know, I understand the content, and so if you, I get to decide if you need a little nudge, do I nudge you a little bit? Do I tell you to suck it up and, and quit whining? And really teach these people to think. That's what it's all about. So the, our, our focus has changed. I think we're gonna see that impact later as these kids grow up, and uh, hopefully they, they don't lose their love of mathematics and science and engineering because they, love, they do love it as children. Mm -hmm. And somewhere in that sixth, seventh, eighth grade, somewhere there, we, we kind of get them out of that. So, I, you know, this is just an effort from my, from my side, trying to keep them with that love of mathematics and keeping it fun and keeping it something that they decide, you know, I, I, I want to stick this out. And it's okay to do that because this, this is great fun. You know, I, I'm, I'm kind of thinking and chuckling in my head that the head of the mathematics department at a state university decides he's going to write a comic book. <laughs> what was the response when you said that? But then you said, oh, but wait, I'm going to teach them about mathematics. Well, uh, I actually did this before I was department head. But I was associate dean of the college when I did it. I tend to do some weird things. And the math TV show that you mentioned is probably one of those weird things. But it's all an effort to kind of show that math is a, is a fun topic. And it's a useful topic. And trying to get us away from that, okay, today let's turn to page whatever. Right. And, you know, just making it interesting. Keep those kids engaged. That's What's it. our superhero's name? <laughs> Wonder Guy. Wonder Guy. And it's just completely accidental that he has a big W on his chest and his suit is Western Red. Accidental. Uh, no uh, copyright infringement there, uh, logo just police. One of those things. It just accidentally happened. But in Operation Comics Wonder Guy, it's the kids who are the smart ones at math. They are. Indeed. You know, they... kids always love that when the, the adults not, you know, kind of the idiot and then the kids sure. save the day. So I thought the kids would associate better with that. It's empowering. Yes. Indeed. Dr. Bruce Kessler, thanks for joining us. Great talk to you. Outside the Book continues. I'm Barbara Deeb. We're coming to you from the Southern Kentucky Festival of Books, where we take you inside the author's mind and outside the book. Joining us now, very popular author, Katherine Howe. Thank you for being with us. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm delighted. You're a native Texan. It's and true. And yet you write about something so different than Texas. <laughs> and in particular, uh, your book, the, the Psychic Book of Deliverance Dane, which you say is a mouthful, 
quite popular. You're, you're dealing with the Northeast at this point. And, That's true. Uh, yeah. That's true. I relocated to the Northeast, to the East Coast, uh, just outside of Boston, Massachusetts, when I was in graduate school. And I'm trained as a historian, so I came to study American studies at Boston University. And I have to say, I was just inspired by the surroundings. My husband and I moved to a small town called Marblehead, Massachusetts, which is one town over from Salem. And I don't know if you've ever been to Salem today, but Salem today has very a lot of kind of witchy activities, as you can imagine. It's very festive, especially around Halloween. And I was really struck that here I was living in a part of the world where for generations upon generations upon generations, people really believed that witchcraft was real. And so the story in the Physic Book of Deliverance Dane is a Harvard graduate student discovers that one of the Salem witches might have been the real thing, but not the real thing in the pointy hat and fantasy sense, the real thing in the way that the colonists actually believed witches to be. Now, so I got to ask, living there, doing the research for this, did you come away with a different opinion about that subject? Well, you know, it's New England is kind of a haunted place, and I have to be honest with you, you know, we lived in a house that was built in 1705, and there was one afternoon when I was making dinner for my husband and for his little brother who was visiting, and it was a hot summer day, and I was making something on the stove, and I don't know why I was using the stove, but it was boiling hot and my sweat is running down my body and the house has been standing since 1705 and I had one of those moments where here I am, my family's in the other room, I'm in this space doing this thing that women have been doing forever. And it was really a profound moment for me. I felt like it, one of the things we like to look for in historical fiction, I think, is communion with the past, a deeper understanding of what it felt like to live in the past. So in the Physic Book of Deliverance Dane, I'm really exploring what it felt like to be living during the time period of the Salem Witch Trials. And so in this day and time with a modern audience, mm -hmm. Is that something that rings true in your opinion across the board that most people can connect with that? You know, you mentioned this this communion with the past, that that's searching for. I think the real goal that we look for in fiction is empathy. I mean, I think one of the central things that we look for in fiction is to try to understand what it feels like to be another person. I mean, any one of us who sat down and read a novel and actually cried at the end and realized that we're crying over the fates of people who have been completely made up. I mean, I think that fiction exists in order to bring us out of ourselves, to let us travel to a different time and a different place, and to experience what it feels like to be other people. And romance, you know, you're, you're lauded for your period detail, yes. certainly your research, and romance. Now, romance is <laughs> kind of like humor. Hard. That's a tough one. It is hard. Yes. It is hard. And and I'm kind of a I'm kind of a square, so it's a little bit tricky for me. It's hard when you know your mother's going to read a book. I yes, got to get gotta really, be careful. Uh, so I'm a little square that way. The Physic Book of Deliverance Dane does have a romantic story right at the center. My graduate student character, his name is Connie Goodwin, uh, stumbles into a guy who is working as a steeplejack, his name is Sam, and one of his reasons for being in her life is to kind of pull her out of her brain. She spends so much time in her mind, and she's not really engaging with the world, and I think that her romantic relationship with Sam is important to that. Similarly, the story in my second novel, The House of Velvet and Glass, is very much a love story, and it's about finding love a little bit later in life when you least expect it. And so, how tough is that? I mean, um, method acting, method writing. You know, how do you how do you do the research for that, or how do you how do you get that empathy from your characters? Well, certainly with the love story, a lot of people teased me with Physic Book of Deliverance Day, and they think that Sam is based on my husband. Okay. He shares my husband's uh, sense of humor, to be sure. Um, but I think that for a lot of us, it's not so difficult to think our way into different people. Um, and so I spend a lot of time researching looking at historical details, but also just thinking about what it feels like to be other people. And I should warn anyone who sits next to me in a cafe, I am listening to you, and I might be writing down what you're saying. And not only writing down what you're saying, but also observing Absolutely. and, and uh, kind of taking that person in. Absolutely. Not always so easy to do. <laughs> so you're, what you're telling me is you spend time in cafes and you observe and you listen, <laughs> but how do you write? Do you have a, a system, a method? 
I do. I get up in the morning and I make coffee first thing because I'm a hopeless caffeine addict. And then I usually sit down and start working right away. Uh, and so I, when I'm in a drafting mode, I can be a little bit weird to be around because I'll, I'll sit in my pajamas working until I discover that I haven't had anything to eat and it'll be hours and hours later. And so sometimes I'll leave the house in order to work in a cafe, but I tend to work in a very focused way. Uh, some novelists like to dive right in and see where the characters take them. Um, I'm more of a detail-oriented person. I like to use a pretty substantial outline. And when I'm drafting, sometimes to make myself be productive, I'll give myself a word count assignment for the day. When I was working on my second novel, The House of Velvet and Glass, I made myself write 1,500 words a day. Uh, which is wow. a lot. <laughs> you are tough on yourself. I am really very brutal, yes. <laughs> but you're also a teacher. Yes, yes. I'm teaching right now at Cornell University in the American Studies program, class on historical fiction, and then I'll also be teaching a class on ghosts and the position of ghosts in fiction and in American culture. Do you believe in ghosts? I can't answer that question. Do you believe in ghosts? <laughs> I can't answer that question either. So what's ahead for you, your new book? I mean, is there something yet to do, like something down the road that you hope to accomplish? Well, definitely. I have another novel that's coming out, and this one is going to be aimed at a, uh, a young adult audience, in fact. Uh, it's called Conversion. The title could change. It'll be out next summer, summer 2014. And it's sort of a modern-day updating of The Crucible, and it's based a little bit on an outbreak of conversion disorder that happened in Leroy, New York last spring. It was all over the news. I don't know if you guys happen to see it around here, um, but a group of teenage girls in a town not far from where we live, not far from Cornell, started behaving in a very strange way and speaking disordered speech and, and twitching and they couldn't control their bodies. And so, I, and no one could figure out what was the matter with them. And so it was all over the news media and I've taken that story because obviously it reminded me a lot of what happened to the young girls in Salem. So I'm taking that story and I'm putting it in Massachusetts for a modern context and it's called Conversion. And young adult, that's a whole different audience. It is a slightly different audience, although you'd be surprised how many grown-ups secretly read young adult. Maybe they don't broadcast it, but it's pretty widely read. Um, the thing that I'm interested in with that is Physic Book of Deliverance Dane looks at the Salem Witch Trials from the witch's point of view. But I wanted to look at it from the afflicted girl's point of view. And I was very interested in watching this story in Leroy, New York unfold, how young teenage girls today would, you'd think, have it a lot easier than teenage girls living in seven 17th century Massachusetts, and yet teenage girls today are under so much stress and pressure that their bodies literally can't take it. And that was a very interesting question for me, and so that's something that I explore in conversion. To be, I can't wait to read it. Yes. I'll read one of those young adults. I'm one of those people. That's okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> Continued success to you. Thank you so much for having me. Author Catherine Howe. Okay, now that we've been talking with all these authors here at Outside the Book, ever wonder what it takes to write a book? Well, we've got a guy who wears both hats. Uh, Chuck Sambuccino joins us. He's an editor for Writer's Digest, a best-selling humor book writer himself. He has a blog. He's the guy. He is definitely the guy who's going to help you create your writer's platform. Chuck, thank you for being here. Thanks for having me, Barb. Well, so I want to talk about your books, because I love the Garden Gnome Attack, which Excellent. may be made into a movie. We want to talk about that. But first of all, let, let's look at the craft and the art of writing. In this day and time, what's it take to be a writer? I mean, to get something, it's one thing to be a writer, but another thing to have something published that you've written. Sure, sure. I mean, I'd say first off, let's talk about determination. You're going to need to work on your craft and your project for years to come. And this is something that not a whole lot of people do, and this is what's going to separate the masses who don't get published from the very few who do get published. Because you write your novel, and that is a long endeavor. Sometimes it takes years. That's just the first step. Then after that, you have to rewrite it. You have to revise it. You have to get other people to read it, get their thoughts on it, draft a query letter, draft a synopsis, draft a proposal perhaps, send it off to agents and editors, and then hope for the best. It's, it's really just a long process, and only the, the really truly dedicated are going to get published. I work for Writer's Digest, and our job is to help give writers the tools to to see them through. But one thing you didn't mention is the big R. You have to be prepared to be rejected? Is that, that's true, that's true. What happens is 
once your novel's written, you're going to write a one-page query letter. And this query letter is your first contact to literary agents and editors saying, hey, here's what my book's about, would you like to read it? And then from that point, you are going to face rejection, and that's all part of the game. It's kind of a numbers game. There's only a certain number of agents and editors out there who are going to connect with your book because they have to fall in love with it. So rejection is definitely part of the game, sure. Um, that's all part of the, the long process of having passion and determination getting published. You know, in television, we have something called demographics, of course, where you choose a program and you're targeting a certain demographic. You're hoping that people in this particular sure. age group, this cohort, are going to watch, okay? Same with literary agents. Like, for example, I'd want to be sure that my query gets to this particular publisher because they might be more interested. Perhaps when you're dealing with, uh, when you have a book, and you want to send it out to get published. You send it out to either a literary agent or an editor at a publishing house, and each one has their very specific likes. Some will deal with genre stuff like science fiction and fantasy. Some will do nonfiction. Some will do kids, et cetera, et cetera. You got to target the ones that will be important to you because that information is available through, you know, Writer's Digest books like what I do, and information is available through their individual websites. Targeted submissions, much like if you were doing any kind of marketing, you know, going after the demographic who will buy. That's a good question. Yeah. Now, you have a blog, a very popular blog, mm -hmm. the, Guide the Guide to, to Literary, Literary Agents. Agents blog. Yeah, one of the biggest out there in the publishing industry. So, you know, you're using, you're a part of the digital age, okay? There's talk that one day we will live in a society where we don't have books. I, I don't think so. I mean, just uh, today, you see, um, we still have CDs and we have digital music. They kind of live hand in hand and we exist with them both. And I believe that print books and ebooks can live. You know, in harmony. I, I, for one, am never going to want to buy that many ebooks. I love holding a print book in my hand, but that's just me. You know, and there's my mother, who should be the opposite, who loves ebooks. So I really don't think print books are going anywhere. But the most important thing here is that people read. If you write something and people are reading it, does it really matter? if they're reading it on a Kindle or on an iPad or if they're reading it on a beach in a book. If you write it and people enjoy it, then we have to be happy. I mean, let's just, you know, cut our losses here. That's right. Build it and they will come. Yeah. Speaking of building it and they will come, you're, you're a humor writer. Yeah. Uh, you, you write the, the significant stuff and then you write the humorous stuff, which is significant in my world, the garden gnome attack. Yes, how to survive a garden gnome attack. Talk about that. Well, first of all, I mean, if we could just be serious for one second here. Okay. Barbara, garden gnomes are murderers, okay? Who knew? The, up, up to a thousand deaths a year are attributed to garden gnome attacks, according to the uh, German hotline, which I can't really speak about for legal purposes, you understand. Um, and what I did was I wrote the book back in 2010 as a guide to how to ward off and prevent a garden gnome attack in your backyard and around the home. And unexpectedly, well, I shouldn't say that, but it, it, the book just took off. It was on the humor bestseller list along with John Stewart and Chelsea Handler. Wow. And then what happened was, our very uh, exciting news, what happened was Robert Zemeckis, the man who directed Back to the Future, attached himself to the film rights. And when that happened, Sony optioned the film rights off us. So we think it's going to be a movie. It's no guarantee, but it's very likely it's going to be a major motion picture here coming about 2014, 2015. Now, animated? Are, is our gnome going to be animated, or are you hoping some actor that you like is going to play? No, it's live action. Live it's a great action. great question, but the gnomes themselves will be animated. I gotcha. Yeah. And actually, in a previous interview, somebody once asked, MTV News once asked me who I saw in different roles, right. and I answered the question, and I got in big trouble for that. Okay, that's a so no -no. we're not going to go there. So I can't, I can't answer that question, but it is going to be live action. Well, let's just hope it's, it, it follows through and I becomes hope, a movie. I hope it follows through. Uh, you, you do have to check out uh, Chuck Sambuccino's uh, humor books, because they're, they're, they are quite humorous at that. What's ahead? Oh, I'm, well, I have, two, I have two kind of tracks. I teach people how to get published for Writer's Digest, and then I make them laugh with the humor books. Very different things. In fact, if you're interested in any of this stuff, just go to chucksambuccino.com. Google my name. If you're anywhere close, it should come up. Um, chucksambuccino.com is a great starting place. But right now, I'm just pitching the next book on writing, you know, preparing the next books for Writer's Digest, the 2014 Guide to Literary Agents and the 2014 Children's Writers and Illustrators Market. And we're pitching our next humor book, which I'm not allowed to talk about. Not allowed to talk about Chuck Sambuccino. That's outside the book from the Southern Kentucky Festival of Books. Thanks for joining Thank us. You.